Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Daniel and Revelation seminar. Uh, before we begin, we're going to uh, start off with our nightly quiz. And so, how many of us have been enjoying the Daniel and Revelation seminar so far? Amen? Amen. I hope you guys are learning something new. We're going to go into our quizzes, and whoever answers our quiz questions, of course, they will have a prize. It's a, it's a Bible bookmarking that we have. We're kind of uh, blessed to have this Bible markings. And so uh, we're going to have three questions tonight. And uh, whoever answers the question, please come to the mic in the front here. We'll have someone in the front pew who has a mic that, will, that you can share your answers to. And if you get it right, you can come and claim your prize in this goodie bag. All right, so let us begin with our first question for tonight. You guys ready? Yes. Question one What are the threefold blessings of Revelation? What are the threefold truth, I mean, truths, threefold blessings of Revelation? Red, his, and pink. Yes, correct. All right, so she got it correct. The threefold blessings is read, hear, and keep. Good job. You can come to the front to grab your prize. You can see this in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Congratulations. All right, good job. All right, let's go on to question number two. Remember, for those who have answered and got the question correct in the past, you guys are exempted from taking this quiz. All right, question number two. What does the Greek word apocalypsis mean? What does the Greek word apocalypsis mean? Anyone? Yes. To reveal or to make known. To reveal or to unveil. Correct. She got it right. You can come up to the front. To reveal, to make known, or to unveil. Congratulations. All right. So that's what the Greek word apocalypsis means. It basically is the word for revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation is, that word revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis, which just means the revealing or unveiling. And it's going to reveal Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? All right. Question number three. What do the seven stars and the seven candlesticks represent? What do the seven stars and the seven candlesticks represent? Seven stars means angel, and the seven candlesticks represent seven charges. All right, good job. All right, you can come up front to claim your prize. The seven, the seven stars represents the seven angels. Congratulations. Seven stars represents the seven angels or messengers of the seven churches. We also found out that they can also refer to God's teachers and ministers in his church who reflect God's love. The seven candlesticks represent the seven churches. All right, so good job, everyone. Uh, thank you for participating in our nightly quiz. Now, we have a surprise for you. We have a bonus question. <laughs> All right, so this is our bonus question. This is because the, uh, on Sabbath, we only gave two questions. So this will supplement for that third question. All right, so here is the bonus question for tonight. Bonus question number four. Who is involved in the chain of command of how God shares his messages to the world? This is very important. Who is involved in the chain of command of how God shares his messages to the world? You can read this in, in Revelation chapter 1. Do we have any brave soul that would like to attempt? Anyone? I see a hand. Thank you for volunteering. Yes. Then 
God, uh -huh. then tithes, then the Holy Spirit, then the messenger, then the churches, then the people to the rest of the world. All right, good job. You can correct. You, get, you can come here to the front to claim your prize. She got it correct, everyone. Here you go. Good job. This is basically, if you notice up on the screen, this is the chain of command of how God uh, sends his messages of revelation to the entire world. Notice what it says. God gave the message to who, everyone? Jesus then gives the message to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit gives the message to? Notice how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are involved. You have the God the Father, you have the Godhead being involved in giving uh, a revelation of Jesus to the entire world. And then after the Spirit, it goes to the angel, and then the angel gives it to, who is John, by the way? John is a prophet, right? God sends his message to the prophet. And then John wrote the message in a book, which is the book of Revelation, and he sent it to the seven churches. And then the, se the seven churches were then supposed to share the contents with who, everyone? The world. Isn't this beautiful? How God has a chain of command, which involves God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, His prophet, I'm sorry, His angel, His prophet, and then His churches, and then, of course, the church or the ministers give that message to the entire world. Amen? Amen. All right. So I hope everyone is blessed. Right now, we're going to give it over to our brother Renz. Good evening, everyone. So I, you were asked a while ago how you're all doing, and I was listening, and it sounds like some of you were already tired. So I want to ask again, how is everyone doing tonight? Even more tired than a while ago. <laughs> okay. So again, my name is Renz, for those of you who don't remember. And tonight, our message will be about... Um, message will be about the throne room, which is right after the seven churches of Revelations 2 and 3, and now we'll be talking about Revelation 4 and 5, okay? So before we start, I want to start off actually with this verse. Um, it reads, after these things, after, after John the Revelator learns about the seven churches, he looked and behold, he looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. A door standing open in heaven. I want you to know that the Bible is not a book or is not a worship that is given to us that is close or that is um, excluded or specific to certain people. But the Bible and the Holy Scripture are things that came from God and it is open to everyone that is willing to receive it. If you are willing to come and accept this call from God, just as John did, I invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your place of worship is open for all of us. We thank you for you have given us this opportunity to learn more about you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us with your Holy Spirit and please guide us. And as we study your word, Lord, may we be able to understand what it is that you want to tell us. Thank you for, all, for everything that you've done for us. This is our humble prayer in your precious and holy name. Amen. So once again, we begin with this idea that John is once again sees something. And the first thing that he sees is a door that is open. 
a door that is open. And a voice came, and he heard like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Things that must take place right after the history of the seven churches. So, without hesitation, John accepts the call, listens to the voice, and the first thing that he sees, that right after he was in the spirit, or right after he receives this vision, behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So the first thing that John sees, the moment that he enters, or the moment that he comes into this place, is a throne and one that was sitting on the throne. And we can understand that is God the Father. And he was sat there, this is the reason why, he was sat there, was like a jasper and a sardius stone, sardius is like a crimson stone, in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne and appeared like an emerald. So with these descriptions, first a jasper, first, and then a sardius, and then a emerald, all of which are precious gems, precious stones. But the key point here, for me at least, is that there was a rainbow around the throne. Now, what is a specific story in the Bible that talks about a rainbow? Noah. And what does the rainbow represent? It represents God's mercy. It, repre it represents His love and His kindness towards the humanity. That never again will He perish the world. So John enters this place, and right away there is a throne. And we can understand it is the throne placed in heaven. And in this throne place, not only is it majestic, not only is it precious, not is it only covered with, with expensive precious stones, but there is also a rainbow that can be seen hovering around the throne. Now this gives us the understanding that God, the Heavenly Father, is merciful upon all of us. We read on in Revelation 4, verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, does anyone know what... Um, do I point? There's no pointer? Okay. Does anyone know what the 24 thrones represent? Anyone have an idea of what the 24 thrones represent? The 24 thrones is basically a representation of the people of the unfallen worlds. It is the representation of the unfallen worlds that has yet to sin. So in this, in this throne room, not only was there um, God the Father, but there was also 24 thrones for humanity, for God's creation. And in, this, in these thrones sat 24 elders, and they were clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. They had white robes and, and crowns of gold on their heads. Now I want, to, I want to talk about the crown of golds. Now in the, in the Greek Bible, the crown represents not a crown of authority or a crown of, a crown of um, power or... Um, you know, like a, like a king here in the world. But the crown in the book, in the Greek Bible, represents a crown of life or an achievement. So these people, these 24 elders, not only were they clothed in white robes or represents purity, but they also were wearing crowns of gold, which represents that they had achievement or they were able to succeed against the enemy. They were able to succeed against... Um, this, again, sin. No sin was found in them because they were pure and they had achieved against sin. So these 24 elders, the redeemed or rather the unfallen humanity, represents people who have this ability or achievement that they were not swayed by the enemy. So again, we begin with in the throne room, there is God the Father and there are 24 elders but in the throne room, there's also um, thunderings, there were lightnings, thunderings, and voices. 
as well as seven lampstands of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So who do we have so far? We have the first in the throne. Who's sitting on the throne? God. And who's sitting on the 24 thrones around the center throne? The 24 elders representing the unfallen mankind. And there are also the seven lampstand, which represents the Holy Spirit. It represents the Holy Spirit, which are the seven spirits of God. We can find what the seven specific spirits in Isaiah, I believe, chapter 11, um, verse 2, if you want to look at it. But it represents the Spirit. So, so far we have God, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit, and the 24 elders. What else is in the throne room? In the throne room, there was a sea of glass. Now, this is um, a same image that was seen in Exodus when people saw God. There was a sea of blue water while they were looking at God, if you want to look at it. But m the most important part here is in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. Full of eyes in front and back. And now this talks about this talks about the same four creatures found in, um, found in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 5 to 21. And simply put, these four creatures represent, um, they represent, the, they have four faces. In, the, in, the, in Ezekiel, they had four faces. But here, they represent having eyes in the front and the back. Meaning to say they know everything or they see everything that is going around them. They had, um, and if we look back in Ezekiel, some of, the, some of the characteristics that were seen from these creatures were they were traveling in speed of lightning to and fro, and they had wheels, meaning that they were going in all directions, and that they had eyes of all knowing. So in other words, these four creatures represent the, um, the fact that God's mercy and everything that is happening in the throne room is going all around the world, is affecting everything that is happening in the world. And this is given to all the world. In verse 7, the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature was like a calf, and the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. So these creatures represent the same creatures that was in Ezekiel, okay? Now, Revelations 4.8 talks about what they're doing in the throne room. And they, the four living creatures, having six wings, were full of eyes and around within, and they do not rest day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This same, this same words can be seen in, um, in Isaiah, talking about the glory of God, talking about the majesty of God. So again, in this throne room, what we can see is, first of all, God is in the middle, and there were 24 elders surrounding God, and as well as the Spirit hovering around all of them, with a rainbow over showing God's mercy to mankind. And now we have the four creatures crying out aloud, saying a message unto the world, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The first thing that I want you guys to understand in, uh, in Revelation chapter 4 is that this is an image about who God is, what He's done, and why He deserves our worship. Who God is, what He has done, and why He deserves our worship. So first of all, God is, is worthy of our worship because He is God, simply because there are no other gods around Him. Now. Does anyone know where else the last line can be seen or a similar line can be seen from in the Bible? If we look in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, and if that's difficult to read, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and in the Word was God, and the Word was God. 
this can also be seen in the Old Testament, a description of God and God alone. No one else in the history can, be, can, can this description be, um, be pointed at someone other than God. So the first reason on who God is, is the re or why we worship Him, is because He is God and He is God alone. There is no other God in the world like Him. There is no other God who can, who can go against Him or even match Him, but He is God and God alone. Revelations 4 and 9 reads, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Now before we move on, what does the red text says? Whenever. And whenever and how often do the four living creatures praise God? How often? It says there that the four living creatures do not rest day and night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So meaning to say that they are doing this constantly, 24-7, without rest, without stopping, without, you know, they are constantly worshiping God. And it's saying that whenever they worship God, the 24 elders also go on and say, they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So what was the first reason why we worship God? Because He is God and God alone. The second reason why we worship God is because He created all things. He is the one who created us. He is our creator. And because of this, He deserves our, wor is our praise and our worship. Now this is why I want to go back to verse 10. In the red text there it says, cast their crowns. Remember in the beginning when we talk about the idea of crown, and I believe it is chapter, chapter 3 or chapter 4, that these elders had crowns. So these elders or these, these pictures of men and elders, they were wearing crowns. And what do crowns represent? They represented their achievement of not failing against sin. It is an achievement of being um, having eternal life. Their achievement over their own decisions. Because they decided not to go against God, they have achieved, or this crown represents their power against, or their overcoming against sin. But now, when they are worshiping, they cast their crown before the throne. Now, what does this imply? This implies, this is an implication that everything about them, yes, they have won against sin, Yes, they have overcome the enemy, but even then, they will not trust in their own ability. They will not trust in their own power, but rather they will submit even their achievement against the enemy. They will submit it before God. Now, many times for us, we like to give glory to God when it is an acceptable thing. We like to give glory to God when we are able to serve the church. Say, Lord, I was able to speak today and I praise you for it. Lord, I was able to sing for your church today and I praise you for it. But the, the, the bad things about us, the things such as our, our sinfulness, we like to keep it away from God. We like to keep it within ourselves and we don't want God to see it. We, want, we are ashamed of ourselves. Yes, for them, it sounds easy because they were able to achieve the ability to overcome the enemy. But how much more about us? How come we pick and choose between the good and the bad of what we offer to God? When them who had everything done completely, they, they give every single thing to God. They give their, their ability to, to choose for themselves, the ability to achieve over the enemy, so how can we expect to do the same like they do? How can we expect to give 
our worship to God properly if we pick and choose our worship to Him. If we pick and choose what we want to give to Him and what we offer to Him. So this implication, first of all, again, I want to recap. We worship God because He is the God and God alone. And we worship God because He created us. Therefore, like the 24 elders, we must cast our crowns upon the throne. In other words, we must cast everything unto God. The good, the bad, the best, and the worst. We should give it all to God. That is what Revelation chapter 4 is all about. Where in the throne room, this is, by the way, this is happening constantly. This is not a one-time event. But this is happening constantly in heaven. That is worship in heaven. Now, before we move on, I want to ask, when we worship God, does worship only happen in church? Yes or no? No. Where else does worship happen? Happens in our home. It happens in our room. It happens personally. It happens individually. It happens in the group. On top of that, it also happens when we walk on the streets, when we go and interact with people, when we share times with people, when we talk with others. Worship happens in every single thing that we do. Remember what the Bible says, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Therefore, just like that, that's why the four creatures, they were worshiping and they were doing it without rest. Everything, every day and every night. And just like the elders, they were following and they were worshiping 24-7 without stop. And just like us, I, I, there was a quote that I read one time. Um, a pastor was saying, you know, God does not, ex that God does not want a weekend visit. God does not want a weekly visit on the Saturday, on the Sabbath. But God is expecting us to visit Him every single day. Meaning to say, we don't just go and visit God on the church on the Sabbath, or on Wednesday midweek, or on Friday Vesper. But as much as God loves that, God doesn't want it to end there. Just like in the worship on the throne in heaven, God wants our communion with Him to be a daily and renewal thing. If, if the worship in heaven is like so, how do we expect ourselves to be fit in heaven if we can't do the same here on earth? If worship in heaven happens 24-7, they're singing songs, they're worshiping God, and here on earth, we only worship God on Saturdays, on, on Vespers, or on, on midweeks. How do we expect ourselves to be fit in heaven? Therefore, before we go to heaven, we must start practicing and we must start living how it is like to live in heaven. Amen? Amen. So now, Revelation chapter 5. In the throne room, everything was perfect. There was worship and there was great things that are going on. And it was happening 24-7, but there was a crisis in the throne room. What is this crisis? It is, there is a sealed scroll. Let's read what the scripture says. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed, on, and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now this is actually an introduction to Revelations, I think, 6, 7, and 8. 6, 7, and 8. But that will be for another topic. So there is a, there is a scroll and it is sealed. What does it mean when it's sealed? It means that only a certain... So, back in the day, um, like medieval times, you know, today it's easy to... When you send an email to someone, only the person that you send it to are allowed to see it, correct? Unless who, anyone else who has access to that account can open that email and check it. But back in the day, for them to to make sure that no one else can see a letter or a mail, they need to stamp it. They need to seal it to make sure that the people know this is not for you, but only the people who are authorized to open it. So in the same way, 
we have now this picture in the throne room while they were worshiping. There is a scroll that is sealed. And let's read what else, what has happened. Now, a strong angel, there is an angel, a very strong angel. Some, we're not sure who exactly it is, but what we do know is he's strong. Proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And the answer is, or before we go on, now, the scroll could be a few things. It could be the judgment scroll. It could be the title deed to the universe. It could be the book of the covenant, or it could be the book of life. And then, so this angel, this strong angel, is asking the elders and everyone in the throne room, saying, who can open the scroll? And the answer was, there is no one in heaven, there is no one in earth, or there is no one under earth that could open the scroll. Meaning to say, wherever you look in the world or in the vast universe, there was no one that could open the scroll. Not even, not even the strong angel could open the scroll. Now, why is it so important that someone has to open the scroll? Well, let's look at this. Um, If the judgment scroll could not be opened, meaning to say the enemy will never be punished for all his bad doings, meaning to say the enemy will never be eradicated, meaning to say enemy will keep going and going and going. If the scroll is the title deed to the universe, meaning to say no one can ever take control or take authority over the world, no one can take or call himself the king of the world, the god of the world, if no one is able to open the scroll, no one can fulfill the book of the covenant, which is the cross. And if no one can open the scroll, no one could open the book of life, if the scroll is the book of life, meaning to say you and me will never have eternal life. That's why it is very important that someone is able to open the scroll. And it's quite sad that the Bible tells us that no one in heaven on earth or under the earth could open the scroll. But does the story end there? No. The story keeps on going. John saw what is happening, and he is crying. He says, so I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll, or even to look at it. Not even the strong angels, not even the 24 elders. And it, it is interesting, who else is in the throne room? There's the 24 elders. There's the strong angel. There's the four um, creatures. Who else is in the, in the throne? There is God sitting on the throne. There is the Holy Spirit in the throne. So even God and even God the Holy Spirit couldn't open the scroll? How come? One of the elders said to John, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Who is the root of David? Jesus. If we look in Genesis as well as in, I believe, Isaiah, they're talking about the prophecy or the blessing on Judah. Jacob is giving Judah the blessing that no one else was blessed to have. Judah is not, um, back in those days, it is a common thing to first bless or give the best blessing to the eldest child, specifically eldest son. And then the blessing will get less and less and less and less. Judah was not the eldest son of Jacob, nor was he an eldest son of any wives of Jacob. Judah was not worthy. As a matter of fact, the Bible in, I believe, Genesis 27, talks about how Judah was able, to, or Judah ended up um, sleeping with a prostitute woman who ended up was his daughter-in-law. But because of his sin, because of his his wrongdoings, God was able to change it and use that to fulfill His promise. 
all the way from Abraham, he said that I will give you a son and you will be a blessing to many. In other words, to all. And throughout his descendants, if we look in Matthew, the descendants of Abraham all the way to, to Isaac and Jacob, and it wasn't even Joseph, the favorite. It was Judah, and throughout Judah, there was David, and throughout David, there was Joseph, and finally, there was Jesus Christ. You see, the promise of God is not only a promise that was made on the spot, but Jesus had been pre-planned and had been told that he will be the blessing to the nation. Throughout the, sto throughout the, the scriptures, there are many evidence that it only points to Jesus. But Jesus was not in the throne room, at least not yet. Because if we look in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, we understand that Jesus was still on his way to heaven. Jesus was still rising up to heaven. And so, after the elder comforts John, right away John sees, Behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. What is the representation of a lamb being slain? It is a representation of our sacrifice where we atone our sins and we pass it on to the Lamb, that the Lamb may, may die instead of us. And so this, this, in the midst of the throne, there is one that stood as a Lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. What do you think? We, we've studied, we've heard of the use of horns before, right? In Daniel, we, we've heard the use of horns. And horns represent power. And eyes represents all-knowing. In other words, this lamb, not only this person who is in the form of lamb, not only was he slain for our sins, he is also the one who had all power and all-knowing. Imagine someone, imagine in our world today, if there was one, the, the Bible tells us that it will never happen, but if there was one person in this world who had all the power and all the, the knowledge that the world could ever offer, and all of a the sudden they say, I will die for every other person in this world, do you think you can find that person? Do you think that is possible? Do you think that is humanly possible for someone who had all the power and all the knowledge in the world and all of a sudden, they will say, I will die for the rest of the world. Only Jesus is descriptive, or Jesus is fitting of that description. Only Jesus is descript or is fitting of that description of being slain. Even though he is all-powerful, even though he is all-knowing, he allowed himself to be a lamb so that he could be slain for you and me. And it is very powerful that he is represent, or this text represents, or is telling us that Jesus Christ died, or Jesus Christ was slain like a lamb, while he is, he is having the seven spirits of God. And the seven spirits of God, he didn't keep it to himself, but rather he gave it unto the world. He sent it out unto the world and He sent it to you and me so that you and me could also survive, could also overcome, and could also triumph against the enemy. Jesus not only won over the enemy, but He is also giving us now the power to do the same thing that He could do. So that way all of us could be, in a sense, I'm not saying literally, but all of us could be powerful and knowing so that we could triumph over Satan. And the powerful thing is that he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So this is when Jesus in the book of Acts just raised up from earth unto heaven. And the first thing that he did is that he took the scroll out of the hands of the one who sat on the throne. Jesus Christ 
I want to go back to, to this slide. Jesus Christ is claiming, and Jesus Christ was successful in taking the scroll, whether it be the judgment scroll, meaning to say he is taking authority over the enemy. He took the title deed to the universe, meaning to say he is taking claim of the whole world, that he is the, the author and the ownership, he had all author and ownership of this world. He took the scroll, which could be the book of the covenant, meaning to say he fulfilled the covenant that was promised to Abraham. And he took the scroll, could be the book of life, meaning to say he took the scroll that has your name and my name in it. The world was in perish or in peril. The world, specifically John, was afraid for the world because he thought that there was no hope for the world. He thought that there was no one that could open the scroll. John knew right away that the scroll was very important for humankind. And Jesus Christ willingly took the scroll. Where are we now? When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp. I thought this was interesting. Remember a while ago when I said that worship, when we, we talk about how worship does not only happen in the church, but worship happened 24-7 in our lives. Just like the 24 elders, they had a harp, each having a harp, meaning to say they were ready to worship 24-7. Sorry. They were ready to worship every single time they are called upon to do so. They are ready to worship the moment that Jesus Christ came, returned to the throne. They were there and they were ready to receive and acknowledge His authority over the world. Friends, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready for Him to take us home? Now I want you to ask yourself, are you really ready? Do you have a harp ready to play and worship Him? Do you have a trumpet ready to blow, telling around the world that Jesus is coming soon? Because just like the 24 elders, we should also be ready. And golden bowls full of, inc of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Remember in the, um, in the sanctuary in the Old Testament, the incense represents our prayers and our pleas to God. So not only were they worshiping God, they were also crying out and praying unto God. You see, prayer does not end after our, our salvation. Because even, even the elders and the four living creatures who had, was wearing white robes representing purity and the crown over the achievement against the enemy, even them still pray unto the Lord. Even them still pray unto the one through king. There's a quote that I really like that says, when you don't feel like praying, that is the time when you should pray. When you don't feel like crying to God, that is the perfect time to cry to God. When you don't feel like singing to God, that is the right time to sing to God. Whenever you want to depart from God, that is the moment that you need to come closer to Him. And we can see that these, the, the 24 elders, remember what it says that day and night they are coming, crying, worshiping, and praising the Lord. How much more should we? They sang a new song saying, now I took a subject, it's called um, Theology and Practice of Worship. And the new song is the book that was, we were focused on. It was entitled Singing a New Song. Our worship should, in, in, in essence, the, what I learned from that class, or one of the things that I learned, was that our worship should not be repetitive. Our worship should not be um, paulit-ulit in Tagalog, meaning to say our worship shouldn't be the same every single day, where we just, you know, when you guys eat, for, um, eat your food and pray your blessing, 
Do you notice that sometimes you just end up saying, Lord, please, thank you for this food, amen. Anyone else do that? Sometimes I do that. I'm guilty of that. But the 24 elders, they are with God, and they are nonstop praising God 24-7, but every single time they sing a new song. Every single time, they don't stay in their use, in their what they were a second ago, but every time they praise God, they give Him something new. They offer Him something different from before. And sometimes for us, I know for myself, sometimes I get satisfied with just doing it just because of doing it. Sometimes I'm satisfied with, oh, I was able to do it. That should be good enough. But just like the elders, we should keep going and keep looking for new ways to worship God. Having a new experience and a new life within us to offer to Him. And they say, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. So what is the first reason why we worship Him? He is God and God alone. Second reason, He is our Creator. Third reason, he opened its seals because he was slain and redeemed us to God by his blood. Third reason, we worship him because he is our redeemer. He is our God. He created us. And even after creating us, he went out of his way to pay the price and redeem us from sin. Out of every tribe, and tongue and the people and the nation meaning the whole universe they have made us king and priest to our God aren't you glad that you and I are considered prince kings queens princesses in heaven aren't you glad that that the Bible tells us that you and me have the power over this world because of Jesus Christ and it is only because of Jesus Christ. And we shall reign on the earth. Would you rather choose the one who is the serving of the judgment scroll? Or would you rather choose to be the one who is the serving of the book of life? The Bible tells us now, and He is giving us the option, do we go and we accept the judgment scroll? Or do we accept the book of life? Then I looked, John saying, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He couldn't even number them. That was how great the power of God is. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven at the time and on the earth and under the earth meaning the whole universe and such as are in the sea and all that are in them saying there are four oh I'm missing a slide they saying worthy hold on they are saying blessing and honor in glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Friends, this is Jesus Christ. We're not sure if that's the actual picture. No one knows. But Jesus Christ. First of all, he is the Lion of Judah. The Lion is a representation of the most strong, strongest animal in the animal kingdom. Who is the king of the jungle? The Lion, right? Jesus is the representation, and no one else can ever take that away from him, that he is the almighty and all-powerful king of the world. He went in this world to try and tell the world of the kingdom in heaven that he will have power over, that he will reign. But not only was he the king, despite having all the power, 
He chose to be a lamb for you and for me. Even though he had the power to eradicate sin, he chose to be a lamb because it is the only way so that you and me could also be lions against the enemy. So that you and me could also be empowered over the enemy. So that you and me could also triumph against the enemy. There will come a time when we can worship our God in heaven. We can worship Him just like Revelation 4 is trying to depict us. And we will worship Him because He is the God and God alone. He is the God who created us all. And He is the God who has redeemed us from sin. If you want to be in heaven to do and worship the same way, to worship Him in that manner, to recognize Him as your Savior, I would like to challenge you to start worshiping that way while we're still here on earth. Not only in church, not only in our Bible study groups, not only through our seminars, not only through, through our devotionals, but rather in every single way that we live. Just like the 24 elders and just like the four creatures, 24-7, without rest, they were worshiping God. They were worshiping the one sitting on the throne. And I invite you and I challenge you that you and I would do the same every single day.